Shad Adversity. Greetings, I'm Shad. And in this video, I want to reveal the reasons behind another one of these really intriguing castle design elements that we see on real historical castles. In previous videos, we now explore why, why <laughs> medieval buildings and castles overhang their lower floors. We've also been able to look at why castles were painted white, why are gargoyles there, so, so, so many fun things. And this one, another one, because it's really intriguing. You see, this is what we have to understand about castles historically. They were designed the way they were for an act actual functional reasons. These were buildings that had a very specific purpose, and so most of the designs that you see on them, the crenellations, the machicolations, the gate towers, the layout, the, the towers themselves, the half towers, and all that stuff, all these things there for a very specific functional reason. Now what's interesting about this is that even though they have functional purpose behind these designs, they have such a beautiful aesthetic that comes with it. So much so that when people want to build a building that has this visual aesthetic and the function has disappeared. And of course the original function was defense. It was an actual military building meant for warfare. It was a fortress, right? When you take that out, then you just need the aesthetic look and there's no much functional reason behind it. And so we see matriculations that have are filled in, there's no gaps. We see crenellations that are not nearly large enough to give full cover to arrow fire. They're like only this big and only coming up to here. They're visual embellishments now. So what we're looking at here is this, this has happened the same thing. Castle roof lines, specifically, more commonly, the roof lines that are on the towers, you'll see that they have an either an angle or they're either curved or they have this very distinct kind of angle right there. Why is this done? Because it's interesting, it looks good, it looks so good that it has been picked up as the one of the aesthetic styles for castles and we see it like duplicated and repeated on fantasy castles. Disney Castle, look at the towers, look at the roof lines, okay? Hogwarts, look at the roof lines. We just think that like, you're having these curved roof lines, it does, it looks really, really good, but there is actually a very specific functional reason why they were built this way. And I'm gonna reveal, show to you what this is. Now, first of all, there is a main reason and kind of a secondary smaller reason. And I will just mention the, the secondary reason. Okay, so you have walls and you wanna put a roof on it. Now, one of the problems, just kind of tangentially, why you don't wanna put a flat roof on it is uh, water drainage. So at least one side is gonna be angled and then you have drainage to one side. But why does it need to be angled much higher? Because wouldn't just a lower slow, you know, angle? Okay, well, a couple of things. One, if you have a higher angled roof, that technically gives you kind of a space cavity for an additional room, okay? Just that the walls are not straight, they're angled, but if there's enough room for head height, you'll get an additional room out of this roof by angling the rafters much higher. The useful functional thing, we see it in buildings everywhere, just in, even in the modern day, not just, you know, medieval period and stuff, because the roof can essentially function as walls at the same time. This is some of the same reason, technical reasons, design reasons that I feel exist for rounded buildings. Whole video, rounded buildings, there. So, okay, one of the reasons why. The other reasons is snow, okay? If you have a low roof, you can get snow build up on top of the roof, so much so that the weight gets so heavy, like snow can get really heavy, that the roof will cave in. And so by angling the roof up really steep, the snow will slide off the edges. There we go. And it's that sliding off the edges part that comes kind of useful. You see, you can have the rafter hanging over the edge a bit, so water, snow, whatever, when it you know drains and falls down, won't really hit the side of the wall unless there's wind and then it will and so there are other ways you can make sure rain drains off more but if you want the rafter to sit more securely on the the, the wall okay there is a way that you can still get good drainage and get the snow drain to slide off and not hit the wall and that's by adding kind of like a smaller half second rafter to the bottom of the wall that allows the main rafter to rest on the wall because it's more secure this is the main load bearing structure that's where you want the weight resting and then the second one gives you a bit of a lip on the edge that allows things to slide off and not hit the wall or you know kind of pile up on the top edge of the roof depending on how wide the the wall is and on castles real historical castles the walls are at least a meter thick so yeah and because they're a meter thick you could have the rafter resting on the inside part of the wall but then you have a whole nother meter a whole meter that you don't want 
things you know building up on so you can add a secondary part to this to allow uh, full coverage of the wall but again this is an optional thing because having the rafter rest on the, the outside edge of the wall works perfectly fine as well you just had it like a, a cut on the rafter so it rests in and you kind of get the best of both worlds without additional work if you can achieve the same functional uh, you know result in architecture with less work than more you always go with the cheaper you know more affordable option unless you specifically want the aesthetic look well then you might you know do it this other way but there is a circumstance in which you have to do this secondary rafter because this is how they built you have a main rafter on the roof line and then on the bottom corner you have a secondary rafter jutting off the side there is a, a design okay in castle architecture which necessitates this design where the most efficient way to do it is this more elaborate way uh, and you have to and so that's what i'll address next and you know what's awesome about this next part is it is mostly necessitated by one of my favorite things about castles, matriculations. Yes, matriculations or corbeling. So corbeling, you know, the, the corbels, a bit of stone jutting out of the wall that the battlement is resting on to give provision for matriculations. All right, even just corbeling where there's no actual matriculations, gaps in between the corbels to throw things down. This also necessitates the need for this style of roof. And it's all the matter of load bearing walls, okay? A, a proper strong load bearing wall is one that is anchored into the ground and is just a straight line from floor to top because stone of course has great compressive strength but even if it isn't made out of stone you want that weight running down in a straight line if the weight is kind of resting on something that's leaning out of the wall there's not much holding it up there's just gravity underneath whatever part or material is extending from the wall holding it up and so this issue kind of comes in with matriculation now corbels can support a decent amount of weight but you don't want to push that too far so you've got corbels you have a battlement but what if we want to put a roof on this battlement so now all right instead of looking at a wall because walls don't really need roofs sometimes they had them Sometimes they didn't, but towers. Towers are very useful to have roofs on because what do you get? You get an additional room. Rooms are great. Put stuff in them, sleep in them. Have intimate relations with the sister and then push out the kid that was climbing on the outside of the wall that happened to look through the window and saw what you're doing. You can do lots of things with rooms on top of towers. Very useful. All right, so we have a tower and we have a matriculated battlement. So the battlement is extended further out from the actual structural wall that's holding it. You can run into problems if you want to put a roof on it because roofs at times can be very, very heavy. These are big bits of timber, okay? And then they're loaded up with tiles or, you know, the, whatever covering you have on the tower. So it could be shingles, tiles, whatever. This roof can start to weigh a lot. Now, there are cases in which roofs were put on the outside edges rest resting on the part of wall that was resting on corbels, okay? So don't mistake me when I say that this was never done historically, but it's not the ideal situation because having extra weight on things that are being held up by corbels is a little insecure. It's far better to have that weight resting on the most secure part, the load-bearing part of the structure. You can have the main rafters of this roof line resting on the actual structural part of the roof. Now, it's interesting. You, there are a number of ways you could do this. You could have the center, you know, structural part of the, the tower running up through the middle where the extended part is. So you have kind of two wall lines at the very top. Uh, the outside wall where that's being held up by the matriculations and corbels and stuff. And then you have the actual internal part of the tower running up through the middle. And then you have the main rafters resting on that. But you don't have anything covering that gap between the, uh, the main structural wall and the outer wall that's being held up by the corbels. So you need a roof on top of that to cover it. And there you go, you put the roof there, angled closer in to the main rafter that's really the main structure of the wall. And so that means the, the real weight of this roof is resting on the structural components. This design was also done with wooden castles. In actual fact, this is how I discovered why castle roof lines were built on this angle. I was actually making a castle in SketchUp, a wooden one specifically, and I got to the roof and I realized these aren't stone corbels, these are just wooden beams. And so I don't want too much weight resting on these wooden beams, especially the weight of a whole roof. How can I have the, the weight of the roof rest on? All right, I know what I'll do. I'll uh, raise the actual posts that are in the corner of this building right up to the uh, top to where their wall on the that's being held up by these you know extended beams raise those poles all the way up and then put the roof on that but then I realized, oh okay hang on I need a roof that goes on oh that's how they did it 
They did it for a specific architectural reason, so the main weight of the roof will be resting on the load-bearing parts of the wall, not the walls that are being held up by either wooden beams or coils of fire. There we go! But this is the thing, I didn't want to draw my conclusion just on my own casual observance. I needed some confirmation from historical sources, and I remembered that a viewer of mine sent me a link to, well, it's really interesting, it's basically a, an analysis of medieval architecture done by some Frenchman in the Renaissance, and he did like direct sketches, and uh, I can't read French, so I don't know what it's saying, but it's got great pictures, and I've used these pictures in some of my videos already, and there is one picture in particular that shows a cross-section of how roof lines were made with a corbelled kind of outer section. Have a look at this. So first let's look at the walls. Main load bearing wall and ah, there is corbelling that's holding up an, a wall that's been extended off the line of the wall beneath. All right, matriculations, we see this. All right, so now let's look at the roof. The main rafter, okay, the main roof structure. Look at where the rafter is resting on. It's resting on the main structural part of the wall. All the way down, straight line, that's the main roof rafter right there. That's the load bearing part. That's the heaviest part, okay? Ah, but then there's a gap between the main wall and the wall that's been extended off on these corbels. So what do they have? They have a secondary roof line that's resting over top that gap between the wall and the matriculated part, the corbel part that's getting further out, which gives us an angled roof. This is why they did it historically, for a very specific architectural reason. They're smart, these people. They knew load-bearing points, they knew roofs are heavy, they knew the roof had to rest on the main part, and they, so that's how they did it. That is why. Isn't this cool? Curved or angled roofs were not put on historical castles just because they looked nicer or something different. It's a specific reason. There we go. I'm sorry. I find this cool. I, I love discovering the secrets of medieval castle design and architecture, and I do this through my own study, even my own reconstructions of castles and stuff like that. I look at real castles and try and figure out how are they done. And of course, historical sources. I like the picture I shared as well. So I do, I do my best, right? But it's very cool. So thank you for watching. I hope you found it as interesting as I find it because castles are awesome. And of course, I hope to see you in my next video, whatever it may be on. And so until then, 